Williams. Well, good morning, everyone. We really appreciate you being here for a discussion with liquor licensees. My name is Wendy Knight. I'm the commissioner of the Department of Liquor and Lottery. I would like to first thank Eric, the owner of Hen of the Wood, and Jackson for organizing this. Thanks for being thank here. You. Um, yeah, really appreciate it. Um, before the governor kicks us off, I thought it would be helpful if we just went around and uh, did introductions. Okay. <laughs> uh, I am Representative Teresa Wood. I'm the chair of the House Human Services Committee for Living and Waterford. Lisa, he's oh. pointing to you. I'm Lisa Scalotti, and I do the Waterbury Roundabout um, online newspaper here in Waterbury. Representative <clears throat> Tom Stevens lived down on Wooniski Street um, and used to chair of the Alcohol Committee. Um, but don't any longer. Nathan Dunlar, uh, locally here in Waterbury Center, home of the Vermont Beer Collective. Mark Ewald, live in Duxbury, um, the owner of Vermont Beer Shop. My name is Rick Thompson, I live in Waterbury, and I'm a co of Salt and Lake. Luke Williams, Salt and Rhine, live in Waterbury. Chris Nance, uh, new producer of Meads and Ciders and Water Beer. Uh, Mark Fryer, the reservoir on the bench, Tree Brewing. Matt Gordon, resident of Waterbury and owner of the Tropic Brewing. Uh, Charles Martin from PLL Communications and Legislative Director. Amanda Wheeler uh, from the Governor's Office, Press Secretary. I'm Christine Giuliani, I work with ACCB and the Communications Director. Uh, John Zanin, uh, Governor's Office, Special Projects. Heather Pelham, I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Tourism and Marketing. Denise Riley Hughes, I'm the Secretary for the Agency of Legal Services. Kendall Smith, Governor Scott, Director of Policy and Legislative Affairs. All right, well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here in this beautiful facility. Thank you very much for hosting us. Yeah. And, um, Maybe a little bit about why we're doing this. Uh, when I became governor, I went to New Governor's School. They have such a thing, and uh, some of the governors were were talking about how how often you get together with your cabinet, and uh, and we heard everything from mostly meeting every other um, maybe maybe quarterly, uh, maybe uh, by uh, every year, um, sometimes not at all. Uh, and, uh, and I thought, uh, I believe in the team atmosphere, and it works best for me in my uh, business life, uh, racing life, and um, politics in general. I think you get the best uh, results when you bring everybody together. So we meet every single week as a cabinet, and uh, we work uh, trying to, across agencies, uh, to do whatever we can to, to educate one another as to what's going on in our areas. Uh, so that uh, that we can better serve Vermonters. But I also thought um, we can we can serve Vermonters sitting in our uh, in the cabinet in the cabinet meeting and uh, and in the in the pavilion. Uh, but there's nothing like getting out and seeing people and hearing from them. So uh, we did we started what was called the Capital for a Day. We go to a different county. We try to go every single month. Pandemic. Uh, uh, took its toll on us. Uh, the flooding has taken its toll on us, and uh, but we're trying to get back at it now uh, because we want to hear what's going on in our communities, uh, what we can do better. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, there's always room for improvement, and so that's why we decided to go to Washington County first uh, to start this back off uh, because of the flooding. And certainly, the pandemic uh, in in your industry. Uh, Created havoc, uh, and then, uh, and again, the flooding since then in many communities, Waterbury being one. Uh, so um, we're just here uh, to listen and learn, and uh, and hopefully uh, find opportunities uh, to work better for you, and to do uh, to to make changes uh, where they be beneficial for everyone. So we appreciate you coming this morning, and uh, and with that, Wendy. How do you want to kick this off? Yes, thanks, Governor. So what, uh, obviously, the governor said we're here to listen and learn. I thought I would start with some good news, right? Um, so we've been talking about our business-to-business -business, uh, website for 
bars and restaurants to purchase alcohol, actually not purchase but make the order. Um, that's been uh, in development for about a year. Um, Secretary Riley Hughes' department has been helping with us and we signed a contract and so that will launch uh, as a pilot in January and that will allow the third class licensees to go on with a, online with a searchable website uh, and to see where they can find the inventory they want. Uh, so we're excited about that launching. Uh, also, I just wanted to let you know that the department will be prioritizing the issuance of permits and licenses uh, for establishments in those flood impacted communities. So we're prioritizing that. But we're here to listen and to learn. So we wanted to open it up to any uh, questions you have, uh, any concerns, any issues, what we're doing right, what we're, where we can improve on. Um, we're here, here to listen to you. Um, and then uh, Commissioner Pelham has some tourism updates that she can give you on what the tourism uh, department is doing. And Secretary Riley Hughes is always interested in user experience, so if you have any information to share on how it might be working for you as a, a state a business working with the state, um, how that can be. Jackson, you sure. want to start us off? <laughs> sure, I'm Jackson Strayer, I'm beverage director for a restaurant group with, with Heirloom Hospitality. Uh, I think one of the challenges we see from you know, being five from restaurants that liquor purchasing is always a challenge. Uh, you know, we have our bar managers who go out and purchase liquor. Uh, the state has done a nice job, I think, of providing monthly sales learning uh, and, and adding the licensee sales uh, monthly. I think more I think more transparency and more uh, assistance for the licensees would be really helpful. Uh, specifically, I think with the licensee uh, sales that happen monthly, I think if there's a way for us to access that either through a portal or have that shared with us ahead of time. Right now, it's only being shared with the liquor stores. And so we have to go physically get a printout from them. Uh, if we can get a similar thing to the monthly sales on the, on the website, I think that would be really helpful for us. Because right now it's it's kind of, I think it's an unknown for us. So we'll have our bar managers going to the store, they'll buy the liquor and, oh, look, we have a sale on this. Um, we strategize as a company when to purchase and how to purchase. Uh, the monthly sales are super helpful for us, um, being that we purchase the same bottles as our guests at the same price. Uh, so we will strategize around that and try to make bigger purchases during those monthly sales. So if we can get access to the licensee sales that are a little bit more regular, I think that would be a huge help for us. That makes sense. And that's one of the things that the business to business website will allow. Uh, right. It's a more, much more efficient way of purchasing alcohol. With the business to business and the website, is it going to be able to, you know, one of the challenges I think in Washington County and also in Chittenden County, that we have a lot of businesses, uh, a lot of liquor store, or a lot of business, small liquor stores. Um, a lot of product gets dropped in these counties and they go away fast, especially in the summertime. After all, our uh, products that are really important for us, whether it be our cocktail menus or just standard products that are in the season, are we going to have access to being able to get bottles from smaller counties, smaller stores when they end up with a stockpile because they don't have as many people buying the product? And we have all of our restaurants now that are running out of certain products during that season. Yeah, so the intent is for the inventory. So as a licensee, when you sign on to the website, you'll be able to see the inventory that's in the warehouse. You'll be able to see the inventory that's at each of the eight of these spirit stores. Great. So that'll allow you to do your purchasing. Um, you can also then save your orders. So if you're ordering you know, pretty consistent products so that the next time you place an order, almost like with Amazon, you go in and buy again, you'll be able to do that as well. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Are we gonna get, uh, it would be nice, I think, we've, we've got some inside access in terms of looking at what's in the warehouse from an ordering perspective. Is there a way for the state, all the licensees, to be able to see what's coming into the warehouse, what's sitting in the warehouse, so that we can plan out our menus accordingly? Uh, one of the challenges that we have is a bar manager may, you know, we go through cocktail swaps seasonally. Uh, if they're planning to write a menu for the summer business, if they need to plan, I want to use a certain product, uh, 
are they able to see, can we get everyone to be able to see, hey, this is what's in the warehouse, this is our ordering habit, and how can we get ahead of this? You know, specifically, we've had a product, uh, I'll use Get Bar, it's been there before, uh, where we've had a product, knowing it's on the cocktail menu, knowing it's a special order, trying to get a back stock where we have a liquor store carrying a case, the warehouse carrying a case, uh, and it's been a challenge where the, the product doesn't get reordered until all of the products are gone in the state. And if there are random bottles in Aspen County or in Southern Vermont, it's hard for us to be able to plan that menu out and say, hey, we need two more cases. Well, guess what? There's three bottles in Southern Vermont that no one's buying. Right? That doesn't help us. Um, we would easily go through another case, another case, another case, uh, but it doesn't get ordered. And now all of a sudden we're scrambling on our document. So we've tried to kind of teach our bar managers to get their cocktail menus to the stores so that they can see, okay, I know you're using this product, this product, this product, we'll increase our par level, uh, but then there's a drop off from that store to the warehouse and to the liquor purchasing in order for us to keep it all in stock. Yeah, understood. Yeah. So the, that, that again is going to be the benefit of having the website because you'll be able to access the inventory not only at the store, right. but the, the warehouse as well. And if there's bottles that are kind of staggered throughout the state, is that we're going to continue trying to kind of transfer those into uh, the county that needs it? Yes. Okay. Right. Cool. Great. Any other questions about the portal that we're building or what other issues we have? Hi, Mark. I, I, yeah, I know we've talked about it, but I think one of the biggest things that I felt was not opportunity and struggle for a business owner is you know liquor or we buy food and sell so the only opportunity for us to get unlike food beer wine we can all buy at a distributor price we buy it for retail unless we do a post off sale so it forces us to buy large bulk if and when possible and put a significant amount of money into inventory which then you have to keep track of it seems like one opportunity with a portal that really think there should be a consideration of a distributor level price for restaurants. We're a very low margin business and it just seems like it's an extra, I'll call it a tax, but it's an extra opportunity of margin in a business that you know we employ a ton of people, but we're constantly fighting for every dollar and that just seems like an opportunity and portable a portal, maybe that's where we could see it. I know there was talk about specific models, but since each of us run a different business, we buy different things mm -hmm. at certain levels. I think it really needs to be across the board, some kind of distribution of pricing. Yeah, I appreciate uh, I appreciate that suggestion. I mean, one of the things we did about a year or two ago is we made that on-premise uh, sale program so that we were specifically trying to make it easier and less expensive for all of you to buy from 802 Spirit Stores. It always struck me as it's odd that you all walk into an 802 Spirit Store like a walking customer with your checkbook, right? So we've been making incre incremental changes. Obviously, you can use a credit card now um, and then the sales program. But um, I definitely think that that's something that we're looking at is how to, when the governor talked about affordability, we think about how we can make it affordable for all of you to do business with us, right? If we're a control state and the only way you can buy spirits is through the, the department, then let's figure out a way that we can support you and, and your businesses. I think we need to be introducing my answer to the releasing trend of having to have a reliable insurance for a period of time. Our announcement will say that restaurants are Exempt from having liquor license insurance for a period of time. So, where's Charles? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the department uh, recognized that that was probably an untenable um, requirement for a lot of licensees when that bill was passed two years ago. So, last year we asked for a three year uh, extension on that issue. So, is that because it's unaffordable for small businesses? It's a yeah, really narrow market, very hard, hard to find. It. Like a temporary case. Because, like, we have a really hard time 
fighting late night insurance. Yeah. And something that was like very prominent before COVID was being able to go to the bar at 10, 11, get dinner, socialize. And that's a thing that's become really difficult. And you know, I think it's important for the mental health of this town and also for our restaurant workers to be able to get out of work and like go somewhere else and have dinner and a drink. Like we notice a lot of like community kind of discussions and just like peace about the day. And I think being able to keep that around is important. Um, but it is extremely expensive past ten p.m. for any insurance company to want to represent me. And so I think uh, the legislature heard that, and that was part of their impact. They passed that bill was to kind of narrow the chain of liability so that they have some major changes in the system. Landlords who don't have to invest in business are no longer liable for that. All of those things kind of impact the next little bit. That makes sense. Um, <clears throat> from what I hear from Jimmy uh, Spear over at the Chamber of Markets and Brokers or somewhere, um, but I think ideally, like two years ago, this time to improve more and more to know the DNA. So the DTR is a good organization to check in with if you want to hear about how much kind of market is in LCA. But I think we can do that since the whole time. Yeah, it's a really big expense. I mean, one of our first books for like a 20 seat bar was $40,000 a year for late night for liability insurance. And that's after 10 p.m. And then we have an events business as well, so we had to sacrifice doing events on holidays, which we previously could do. So it's just like it's a really huge expense. I mean, that and then like yeah, taxes and finding employees that can afford housing in this area. You know, we're definitely in the tourism industry, and like we support that. But making it possible for small businesses to like continue to support that, I mean, it's it's a really tight grip. It's a really big challenge. Thanks, Brett. I think just to follow up on what Mark was saying about the on front part of the licensee and the pricing and using that portal. I think if, if that online portal gets designed and released where we can find product, uh, if there's take the on premise pricing deal and put that in the portal so that we can find it along with the monthly sales product pricing. Uh, and also, right now we have you know, send out updates, right? All premise on pricing increases like monthly. So if there's pricing increases all on premise get something. If we could add that into the portal as well for restaurants, I think that would be huge. Uh, you know, we're constantly part part of my job is going back and basically going through all invoices and tracking pricing and finding when the state increases the prices. I would imagine at a smaller company, smaller restaurant, if you only have a small team, one purchase person doing the purchasing, especially with FinTech, you go, you buy the product, you move back to the, and you put it into your restaurant. If you're not looking at those invoices every single day, all of a sudden your price is fine, $1, $2, $3, $4 a bottle, sometimes more. Now all of a sudden you're operating two, three months behind where you're losing money because all of a sudden your, your margin jumps 10%. Right, right. Uh, so if there's a way for us to get access to price increases that are also happening within this portal, uh, not to say that you need to send every single restaurant and bar pricing updates, but if there's a way for us to find it within the portal so that we can be active in our pricing increases that we can stay step in step with the state, uh, I think that would also be hugely beneficial for us to, you know, that I go a little bit about operating on very small margins. You know, I think we, every cent counts uh, in this business. And if you all of a sudden are losing 30, 60 cents per cocktail, uh, that can, be, that can be really harmful, especially in a place like Water, Waterbury, where we have a small tourist season. It's summer, it's right. fall, right. you know, it's February, it's March. Other than that, you're trying to figure out how to get back. Um, yeah, the, the, the portal uh, for the um, uh, county pricing piece will have the updated pricing. I just want to be clear that the state is not increasing the pricing. It's the sure. supplier and so everybody's helping. But when, right, so we yeah. just pass that along. But when, you know, obviously each on premise location gets an update, right? In order it's for you all to be uh, dialed in on your pricing, and every single store has the same price no matter what, right? Uh, when those price increases go, how can we get better access to that as opposed to buying something and seeing it on the invoice? You know, right now our, our team goes, they pick up an order after it's already been FinTech closed out, right? They take the invoice, they give it to our, uh, to our accountant, that's it. 
if they're good at their job and are thorough, they're going to look at that invoice and they're going to say, oh, hey, look, we have a price increase here, here, and here, and they're going to notify me and we can then update our price in our group. If you are not paying attention to right. that, which a lot of people don't, that's, again, they're trying to do the main part of their job, which is serve guests at a restaurant. How can we get better access to that so that we know ahead of time, okay, price increases are coming next month. Right, right. Because all the on-premise know that relationship, I think, is a tough one to then take an on-premise, which is struggling with staffing, to then notify every single bar and restaurant that's buying from them. But if we can get better access from the DLC to say, hey, price increases, the portal's here, here's your monthly sales, here's your ordering system, and here are the price increases right, that are coming. Right. Now, all of a sudden, we're proactive and we're able to say, all right, the cost of our model antique is going up $5 a bottle. Are we going to use the sweeper booth in every single restaurant? No, we can't afford that anymore. The guests can't afford that anymore. We're switching to a different yeah. you know? yeah. Talk about tourism, Jackson. Heather, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, what the state is doing for tourism? Yeah, no, I'd be happy to. Um, and again, it's great to see everybody here this morning. Obviously, great food and beverage experiences are part of what we are promoting to the rest of the world when we think about making sure that we're elevating the profile of Vermont, and that's, you know, that's our purview as we're promoting the state as best we can, both for visitation and for relocation. So the mission of our department has expanded um, in that sense, you know, visitation is our, our core business, making sure that we're able to fuel the, the visitor economy. Um, that powers much else, but also thinking about how we can help folks when they are considering moving to Vermont. Um, we have some new grant programs to give communities more resources on the local level to do that sort of concierge level support when people raise their hand and say, I'd love to move here, how we can make that easier for them. And then on the visitation side, you know, a lot of folks don't really see what we do because, of course, you guys aren't the target market. We're, we're um, talking to folks out of state, but thankfully, you know, we do have a robust program. Both last year and this year, we received some federal funds. Um, part of COVID recovery has allowed us to really ramp up our efforts to a level we haven't been able to do in the past. So we have a seven hundred fifty thousand dollar campaign this summer fall. Um, it's, it's a huge mix of tactics, um, as you might expect. Um, but we also are investing heavily in. Video tactics this summer, we have three new videos out. Um, so we are on streaming services like Hulu, Amazon, ESPN, and so forth this summer, as well as you know, digital display. And, uh, those types of what you can expect market-wise. Um, and then just also as a department, so folks know, you know, with the access to some of these resources we have had in the past, we're doing a lot of investment into the type of data that we have so we can have better real-time information on accommodations data, pacing, um, on economic impact, both for the tourism economy as a whole, as well as for what outdoor rex piece of that is. Um, we're investing in some workforce development programs with a hospitality management certificate. We're trying to support um, the museum, as well as some outdoor recreation workshops, skill building opportunities, um, and then some strategic planning, asset creation, and so forth. So it's a pretty exciting time for the department in terms of the types of investments we're able to make that we haven't been able to do before. We're actually actually just launching a new visitation research project, so we'll be doing intercept surveys throughout the state um, to really understand what are the motivations for people and really seeing, you know, for instance, you know, where food and drink, you know, food and drink experiences rank on their list in terms of why they're looking at Vermont um, and where we might find some of those market potential or some of that opportunity. So um, it's an exciting time. You know, I often say we don't know, we don't know. So if we have aren't telling the stories that we could be doing better, I would say please always let us know um, how we can best be describing your region or your industry um, so that we can really get to those compelling stories that are really going to help folks who might be able to experience them. So high level, but you don't have to take the question because that's the word. Can you talk a little bit how maybe the tourism strategy should be impacted on this month? I've been very vocal and classified myself that 
care less about that information. A lot of other people who are there to 100%, yeah. they don't grab the other girls for several months. But uh, it's probably <coughs> that we grab getting to the back of the car, getting to the back of the car, and already covering that. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I would say that, you know, last year certainly was, I would say, a different situation than we had this year. I mean, there was no doubt that, you know, seeing our campus city on the national news for weeks on end was in the water, made a big impact on the ground. Um, so we, you know, we created a whole very much of a campaign last year um, and really, you know, doubled down the best we could to combat those images that people saw. Um, within, in terms of going forward, I mean, this is kind of a new reality, right? We have to figure out how we're going to pivot what we have to virtual events. Um, and also recognize that, you know, that's happening in other parts of the country too. So I think part of the, part of the narrative is that this isn't a Vermont problem, severe weather. You know, it's something that we have to recognize and make sure that we are educating folks as to, you know, what are the trail conditions you might need to avoid this area, um, you know, is a certain state park closed and so forth, that kind of information, but also just reinforcing the positive that, you know, there may have been severe impacts in one community, but, you know, the rest of the state and is very much open. So that's really how we kind of um, approach it, is that we we want to be, we want to acknowledge that, like, as residents, you know, we're very much tied into our new cycle about, you know, we hear more details every, every day about um, what's happening as a visitor, we have the benefit that last year's little bit but we have the benefit that that news cycle is smaller, that they're, they may hear that we've had some flooding, but now they're hearing that Pennsylvania and New York have had some flooding, or Florida's being impacted by a hurricane. And, you know, thankfully, there's also the direct communication with lodging properties. So, you know, directly after an event, lodging properties are able to talk to their customers for a point and say, hey, there's been some impact, but it hasn't. Um, so they can kind of take care of the immediate visitor, and most of the folks that we're talking to are thinking two months, six months, even next summer, in terms of like putting that idea from off their head. So it's a little bit of a fine balance, as I would say, between making sure that we are still inspiring people to come in the future and not reminding them that something quote unquote bad has happened. At the same time, acknowledging that there has been impact in certain communities, and this is where they can find information about where they might need to be or not be. Um, in terms of broad numbers, I can share that, you know, we are coming down off of 2022, which was a, which was a very strong year. Um, you know, rebound from the pandemic, we had the wedding boom and so forth, so we do see that 23 was soft, 24 is, is also soft right now. Pacing looks good for the fall, so I'm hoping that things are going to pick up a little bit. And then I think the final point I would say is that we always have to kind of think about how, um, you know, from what we're seeing, we are not seeing cancellations, people are still coming, but we also know that residents are hurting, and so depending on the, your customer mix, you can definitely see that throughout the state and be impacted close to what we're seeing. I think it was a, like last week, I saw a push to the ACC to see how this could be in Melbourne, reminding people in the social media posts uh, about the, the parts of the state that were impacted. So we try and get out there as much as we can, recruit and advertising, do a, we have an obligation to make sure that people know what's going on in the state. But at the same time, it is frustrating. I know we went through this a year ago, especially with the flooding and debt. Not all parts of the state were devastated. We have national attention. People are canceling their trips. And uh, it wasn't even impacting the area that they were coming to visit. So, so we learned from that and, and tried to do more targeting. Um, but anecdotally, I, I will say I was in Lindenville on Friday afternoon, Friday evening, and uh, to see some of the damage, real severe damage on Ridgewood Road. Like I've never seen, um, and I've seen a lot of people damage in my lifetime, but I've never seen anything like that. So anyhow, I'm getting off the, the exit on 91, and it was back turning up, uh, on the off turning up, uh, and it wasn't construction traffic, it was all kinds of cars from other states. So I don't know if it's getting more normalized, uh, in some respects, people are getting accustomed to the flooding, but they're still coming, at least in that area, heading up to the Burke and so forth. So we'll, uh, but I 
I get I get what you're saying. I make sure that we're we're communicating so that we're open. Yeah, we're open. One of the things that the Department of Liquor and Water you was doing was supporting the messaging from the tourism department and the commerce department in a social media, you know, we're going to be doing a series of social media posts about we're open for business. I was here visiting Waterbury and remember uh, Nathan and Eric and Jackson a couple of weeks ago and I took photos and we're going to start, you know, letting people know that you know, Waterbury is fine and Stowe is fine and we do, you know, Linden and Burke and, you know, with road closures, but really encouraging people to uh, still consider visiting Vermont. You know, it's really important that you have that tourism sector because that's what keeps you alive for the rest of the year, usually, you know, so we know that that's really important. Can I ask another question, kind of both for tourism and for Governor Scott here? I think while we're talking about Washington County, uh, you know, I think it's important that we also talk a little bit about Burlington because everything that's happening in Burlington also affects tourism here in Washington County and Waterbury. Um, you know, what is, you know, is there any update in terms of, you know, what's happening in Burlington with uh, both, both the opioid uh, crisis, transient population, uh, theft, uh, late in theft that's happening in Burlington right now. You know, you drive by, you know, kind of intersection there, Cherry Street, Buell Street, uh, and the, you know, the traffic that is on Buell Street right now is absolutely terrifying between 20 and 30 people with uh, stone bikes sitting right there in front of them. Uh, tents. It's, it's a nasty spot right now in Burlington. And I think when we talk about Tourism, right? And we talk about people coming to the state of Vermont. One of the things that I think the state of Vermont has already done so well is that we are a safe place for people to come and visit. Bring your family, bike on the bike path. Uh, bring your family, walk around downtown. Uh, bring your family, go out into the small little towns that are on the picturesque rivers. We have flooding, like Nate said, that all of a sudden now takes business in Waterbury and Stowe around the state. And we see a drop off. Uh, we have Burlington where people aren't coming to visit Burlington because they may not feel safe or they may, may, they may have never even seen it, but now they're hearing other people talk about it. They're seeing an article in the New York Times about it. Um, you know, I guess I would say what, you know, now that we're a few years in, is really kind of being a front and center of what's happening in Burlington. Where are we at in terms of, you know, I would say passing legislation, getting a little bit tougher on crime so that people don't feel so crazy to walk into every store they walk and walk right out. Those small business owners that are in Burlington on Church Street are obviously suffering. Uh, personally, I live out in Shelburne. Uh, we're starting to see slowly, slowly people starting to creep. You know, South Burlington, Hannaford, uh, those stores right there, someone walking in, you know, off the street into someone's house and holding that knife point uh, across the street there from Hannaford. Scary stuff. Um, so I just can I add to that real quick? Please. Yep. So um, Crossroads on the liquor right here. Yeah, and, it's um, a spirit store. Yeah. Very quickly. Um, to, to say what you're saying, um, theft is out of control at Crossroads. Um, we just invested all in new security systems, stuff like that. Call the police weekly. Um, we had uh, a count recently and it was devastating the how much um, theft we've had. We have people um, in our parking lot shooting up regularly. We have deals regularly we're trying to get off. Um, it, it's really, really bad. We have a railroad right on here. I'm seeing how bad this town is becoming, especially being at our store. I can see all that. It's a liquor outlet. You know, we, we sell all that stuff retail-wise. Um, and I am con we're constantly fending off theft I've never seen it like this. We've never been broken into. I've been there 17 years. Um, we've had two break-ins, um, you know, in the middle of the night. Um, so it is, it's coming and it, it's here. Um, so I just wanted to, yeah. Liquor, cigarettes, that's about what, what they're taking. Um, 
Are you seeing so a lot's happened since Waterbury Village has gotten rid of its police department and relied on a state police contract? Yeah. Um, those of us in the village were very disappointed in that turn of events. Um, are you seeing? And again, COVID has happened since then. Um, are you seeing? Did you have better response when there was a local police department? Um. I, I've definitely seen an uptick. Now, I don't know what that's you know, attributed to, whether that's the police department or not. The troopers here, I can tell you, are amazing. I have their cell phone numbers. I call them regularly. I text them. They're right there. They know our situation. They know. Um, so they're, they're there within minutes. I, I can say their responses are amazing. The one person we have, eight to four. Um, and so I have a very close relationship with them. Um, I'm happy with that one trooper that we have. We do need, I think, a police department, but I, I don't attribute to that. I think it's, we're just understaffed. I mean, one trooper for this for this whole area is ridiculous. Um, but um, yeah, it is, I mean, we have to pick up needles in our parking lot regularly. Um, bags left with needles in them all the time. You know, it's, it's getting pretty, I've never seen it so bad here. Um, you know, I don't know if the restaurant, you know, the restaurants probably aren't, aren't seeing it as much, but you are. Yeah. And people passed out in cars that I had to call the trooper and get them off. I mean, we just had a, a lady who was high, abandoned their dog and they had to call, you know, it's, it's just constant, you know? Um, and, uh, so yeah, I mean, theft is every single day where there's someone walk, running out the door, um, with liquor or something, um, you know, food or whatever it is. So. I think the crazy thing is we all have stories that we're watching and it's, it's happening all around us. Uh, I'll just give you two quick ones. Literally, I was in Burlington this past weekend for dinner. I had a wood in Burlington right off of Cherry Street. As I was leaving in my car in the parking garage, someone clearly impaired, I'm gonna say that someone that didn't own that car pull the car out, I'm waiting in my car while they pull out, they hit the car next to them, they stop, they pull forward, they back up again, they hit it again. And then they drive off while I'm behind them, I snap a picture of the license plate. It turns out they actually hit an employee of ours that kind of wood, that was her car that they hit, and took off. And I'm sitting there watching this happen. I called the Burlington police and say, hey, I just witnessed a hit and run. But before I got to that, I had to listen to the 15 different things on Burlington Police about what I needed to file on the website, one of which was a hit and run. So when I finally got through to somebody after all the 15 options, they said, yeah, you need to file on, on the website. We'll send somebody out to take a look at the car. Luckily, I got a picture of the license plate. I took a picture of the, of the employee's car that got hit. I sent it to her. I didn't know at the time it was her car until I found out, until I asked inside. But, you know, now she's going to have to pay for that because the doctor was not going to cover it. Uh, last, last week, my, my kids in camp over in uh, South Burlington off of Industrial Ave and Williston, South Burlington border. Uh, there's a park right there off Industrial Ave, great tennis court, basketball court, baseball field. Uh, I pull in there with my son after dropping my daughter off at camp. So right across the street from the daycare, there's a car. Again, I'm going to make an assumption that it's a stolen car. Two people in the front, keg, windows open, a keg right in the middle behind them with the kegs tapped. Them drinking out of the tap, shooting up in the parking lot across from the daycare center. And I'm like, okay. So it's like, I thought you wanted to go play basketball. I was like, okay, we're going to go someplace else. Um, beautiful little park, you know? But anyways, we all have stories. I wish there was one easy answer to this, but there's not. Um, one of the bright spots uh, during the legislative session, from my standpoint, was we did make some gains in terms of public safety. It was a priority for us. Um, worked with the legislature on many, many dis different initiatives. Recidivism, I, I think, is an accountability is something that uh, that we tried to focus on, and I think we made some gains there. It's going to take a while uh, to put that into to place, 
Um, but we need people to, to, to get cited. We need people to, to go to court. And they're not going to court. You know? they're, they haven't been. Uh, we have people, you see it, the warrants for their arrests uh, that, that are ongoing. They have numerous, numerous citations. And they just don't go to court because there's nothing anybody's going to do to them. Um, so we've made some changes there. That's positive news. Um, housing um, is, again, something that we all recognize is, is an area. I mean, you see it in your, with your employees. Um, we see it in our communities. We need more housing. And uh, we need to continue, continue to focus on that and treat it as the crisis it is because it's a crisis in Vermont, and, uh, and that has a ripple effect, whether it's uh, the homeless population, but just from a workforce standpoint. And, and what that does when you are able to provide housing for one sector, it opens up uh, units for another sector. So again, we need to continue our push forward with that. Um, workforce from law enforcement perspective, uh, is another challenge. Just like you, uh, law enforcement uh, hasn't been given a pass. Uh, we have 8,000 employees in the state government um, that, um, that that have open positions, right? We, we have an 80,000 uh, person workforce in state government. 8,000, uh, we, we need to uh, fill positions. It's the same with law enforcement in state police, local law enforcement. We have many communities that aren't able to fill positions, can't run uh, an overnight public safety service. Uh, we're trying to fill gaps with state police, but we're, we're challenged ourselves. So the workforce, the demographics, the housing, it's all interconnected. Uh, and that's why there's not just one thing we can work on. We have to work on all of it in order to satisfy the needs. But, uh, I mean, the good news is it can be, we can, we can fix this. We can turn this around. But we have to think about a whole broad perspective of, uh, of, uh, of initiatives to, in order to do that. Because it's not just one. It's all of them together. Again, the demographics in our state tell the tale. Uh, and we keep, you know, we're aging. We have more people over the age of 65 than ever before in, in Vermont's history. Uh, and that's not good news because we're not backfilling with, with a younger, uh, healthier population. It leads to more uh, health care costs. Uh, it leads to uh, a lack of workforce. It, it leads to the need for more housing. It needs, I mean, it's just ongoing. So, again, we need to pay attention to the fundamentals, the basics, housing is one, public safety is another, and try and focus on those areas uh, in order to, to accomplish the goal. So I, I sympathize, um, but we're all, we're all feeling the effects of that in every area. Anything that we can kind of, you know, look to from people like Jeremy for producing beverage, people that we deal with a lot in our industry, uh, you know, mainly with that, but like, you know, I agree with all, there's a lot of fundamental things that need to change and that need to be kind of dialed in for us to get an overall change happening in the years to come. But what about the short term? You know, how does this sound like a Jeremy? Uh, you know, again, we, as a restaurant, they're major partners for us in purchasing from them. Um, what can they do in the short term to help? Get it was passed with the retail theft law that was uh, that will be helpful. Uh, but again, uh, we need to get them to court. We need to hold them accountable. It's not instantaneous. Uh, it's going to take some time for the word to get out. You're not going to get away with it, right? We need to hold people accountable. Uh, and if they if it's a, if they're impacted uh, by uh, by uh, addiction issues. Uh, need to, to focus on that to get them the help they need, but they have to be willing to, to get the help too. Sure. So again, it's multifaceted, uh, but uh, we need to hold them accountable. Yeah, that's helpful. Uh, and just lastly, the, in terms of, you know, kind of the homeless encampments, you know, thinking about the one down in Matagon, 
the bike path in Burlington. You know, if I think of Burlington in terms of the tourist population, people coming to town, you know, what is the number one thing that I would tell anybody from out of state to do while they're in Burlington uh, outside of going to visit these small little towns, rivers, swimming? Uh, I'd say go on the bike path. Uh, I'm not going to tell anyone to go on the bike path with a homeless in the that's, you know, 20, 30 strong. Uh, to feel like, hey, this is representative of what Vermont is. We're the safe little community that you can go with your family and bike, bike, bike. Um, any thoughts there? Well, we can, um, we're, not, we're not the only one suffering. It's, a, it's an actual issue. Yes. Uh, so we, again, need to do what we can here in the state. Uh, but the uh, it's a homeless population. We need more housing, more unions, more emergency homeless shelters and so forth. Uh, but not every community wants a homeless shelter. Um, so we, we struggle with that. Uh, one problem for, for instance is not wanting uh, a homeless shelter in their community. In fact, if there's any community, any area that is impacted or any other is rough. The numbers are far greater. Uh, in, in gross numbers, in percentages in Rutland and in Chippewa County, Burlington. Their problem is far worse. And part of that was through the pandemic. We, we put people in, in hotels and, and created a lifestyle for some. And, uh, and again, Rutland was impacted greater than any other community. Yeah. So, I'm sorry. Again, we just need to, we need to focus on that as well. Thank you. Okay. shelters are part of the answer. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. I do want to move the conversation yeah. back to Washington County, and I'm going to encourage you to reach out to the new mayor in Burlington with your business over there. And certainly, when we have our Chittenden County Capital for the day, we'll definitely be talking about public security. So, we'll invite you to that as well. Yes, Brett. I think something that's like important for all of us to think about here is that like our food scene brings in a lot of young people. You know, there's interest. Like, you can make great money with survey with bartending. Like, it's an awesome opportunity for young people who are maybe going to college or just trying to, like, hike the mountains in the summer and not have a super high stress job somewhere else. Um, you know, we try to bring those people in by being creative, by having cool food scene, by having cool cocktails. But I think something that's important is, like, you know, the business owners here, like, we need incentives and support on finding those people. And like, where can those people live? Like, how can we do public transportation in this area? Like, you know, we want to have this like late night. I mean, the Boston Globe wrote an article about how Waterbury was like one of the best food towns in New England, which is awesome. Like, that feels really good. You know, and we want those people that can give that high level of service. So it's like, how do we capture those people? Like, what incentives do business owners have? Like, how can we be supported and bringing those people in and finding places for them to live? And paying them a livable wage too, you know, like just so I think finding resources like that, I think that's the biggest thing for us, really. I mean, Necky shut down, we both went to Necky in Montpelier, and so you know, interns, they're awesome people to hire, they're willing to work for cheap, they're learning, you know, they've got like positive attitudes because they're passionate, but like we don't have that resource anymore. So, like, where are these resources where we can find people, and like, where can we house them, you know, like. These are big questions, and these are going to help our community grow. And I'm really excited about downtown Waterbury, and I think in the next few years, it's going to be even better. But, like, where are our supports as people that are, like, really pillars of this community, really trying to, like, bring money in, get people excited about eating and drinking? Like, we have employees in the area who work for us who have been here for almost a year and still can't find housing. Yeah. But they want to work in the staff, and they can't find a place to live. And it's housing, big time. Affordability. Yeah, we'll live here and, and be able to afford yeah. to stay here in Vermont as well and attract them because we're, again, we have to, uh, immigration is going to be key, I think, for us in the future because we're not, we're not growing our younger population. We, when I was 40 years ago, when I was in, in school growing up in Barrie, um, we had a, over 100,000 kids in our schools, right, K through 12 hundred and something thousand today it's under 80 you know so it, sh it shows you the trend we're, we're not we don't have the youth we don't have the workforce because we're not growing it from within so we have to look outside we have to make it more attractive so we need the housing but again that's that's complicated too
I urge us to examine the good news side of things. You know, the town is in the negotiations with the state about the San Juan site down here. Uh, that's currently a looks like a park, uh, and you know we need to be um, aware of what potential flood impacts are developing in that area. But there is the potential for up to 80 new units um, in that area there, and being mindful of that and negotiating with the state about that and mindful of the flood impacts. Um, we we are seeing more housing starting to come to water here, so I think that is that is a good thing. First of all, per unit, average cost for per unit, affordable house housing unit in Vermont right now, uh, we're spending between four hundred fifty to six hundred and fifty thousand dollars per unit. So that's difficult to make affordable. So, you know, one of those things where we like to pay our employees like a higher hourly, and it's just, it is difficult with payroll taxes, you know, because it's like you want to pay those people more so they can afford to live. But as a small business, when you're like, okay, you know, I have five employees, I could really use eight because we're super crazy right now, but I can't afford that payroll tax to kind of employ more people at that point. So you have to start making some hard choices, and then you start raising your menu prices. And the consumer has no clue where that cost is coming from. And you don't really have the time to sit there and be like, whoa, there's this, this, and this. You know, they don't care. They're coming in for dinner. So I think like figuring out how to communicate, you know, where some of these costs come from. And as a small business, be able to like grow and scale and have some kind of break, you know, some kind of incentive to like really put more into this community than what we already have. Like, I think that would be really helpful. It, it, it is it's stressful and it's a lot, you know? And you're just trying to do a good thing and you're trying to make your passion like grow and get people excited about it, but like it's expensive, you know? So it's it's just it's a challenge for sure. Affordability. Affordability, yeah. And being here for a long time, you know, it's important. I wanna try out one thing about the housing thing. I can tell you Airbnbs are through the roof. I mean, I have a friend who was looking for a place can't find a place, but there's a hundred Airbnbs. A lot of the rental owners I'm in with all, you know, a lot of property owners and rental owners, and they're sick and tired of being squatted. And I know three people have lost their homes or their rental properties that they, because they, someone wouldn't pay, you can't get them out in Vermont. You, you can't get them out, they're, they're against them. And so they say, you know what, fine. You want to do that? Then we're going to put in Airbnb. They don't want to. I know that. I speak with them. They like long-term security. They like that one year long-term. Even if it costs them a little bit less, you know, or, you know, rent is less, at least they know they're going to get it rented for a year. They want to do that. They don't necessarily want to do Airbnb, but they have to because they can't risk losing their property. I know someone who paid $5,000 for someone who didn't pay for a year to get them out or they were gonna lose their home. And so they're fed up. They're, I know many, many, many property owners that are fed up with squatting and they're against them and they have potential of losing their business or their property or their home. So they just Airbnb it because it's safe. And banning Airbnb is not the solution. It's siding with some of those, those business owners and not so they have to write a big fat check to get them out of a property or there's they can't get them out of a house they have to go through thousands and thousands of dollars of lawyer fees and, you know all that type of stuff and they're just fed up with it so they go to airbnb go try and find a place and you know i have a friend who's moving out of town they got a hundred over 100 airbnbs in this town um and they can't find but they can't find a place around and accessory dwellings are part of the answer. Um, we're gonna have to make some regulatory changes in order to make that happen. And uh, to, to just grow some of the some of the elderly population who have these big homes um, but can't afford to, to sell them and find someplace else because it's four hundred and fifty to six hundred and fifty thousand dollars per unit. So they're stuck, but they have large homes that could could be utilized for more families or or maybe even with accessory dwellings and so forth but it's it's a vicious cycle here and I speak as you know 25 years ago the happiest day of my life was when I sold a four-unit apartment house in Barrie happiest day of my life 
So it's yeah, nine o'clock. <laughs> it is nine o'clock. Yeah, Almost nine. Uh, we want to wrap up. Lisa, do you have a question? Uh, one question for you, Governor, that I think the local folks here in the room are curious to know looking down the road. It's um, August now, but fall and winter are not far away. Um, but partner Gordon and I had a nice little visit at the armory two weeks ago. There was a contingent from the Civil Air Patrol cadets. A whole bunch of teenagers um, were the first overnight guests in the newly remodeled armory here in Waterbury. Um, it's all outfitted, they have cubbies, they have their cots, and the environment inside was really comfortable, air conditioned. Um, they've done a nice job getting that place um, updated um, since it was used by the National Guard. Um, and a lot of folks are wondering, you know, what's next is with that proposal for that facility to be used. As one of the things you were mentioning, we need more emergency shelter space. Will that be back on the on the table as well? Well, we'll see. I mean, uh, obviously, it's it's a useful site for something. Uh, the Civil Air Patrol is using it, and, and that's that's great. Uh, we had anticipated using it for an emergency shelter, but that was that's now off the table. Um, so we'll we'll see what we can do with it. We want to make sure it's viable, it's local, it's uh, something that again. Could be used for something. We'll we'll figure it out, or we'll you know put it back out in the market. Maybe some entrepreneur will do something with it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, I really appreciate uh, you all being here. It's been a great discussion. We've learned a lot. Um, a lot for us to kind of take back and think about. I appreciate the uh, feedback. Governor, did you want to offer any remarks? I just really appreciate you coming out. And uh, again. Make sure you communicate with us ideas you might have, challenges you have. If there's something we can help solve, we'll, we'll do our very best. Um, if there are legislative things, um, obviously uh, you have legislators here today, uh, we should talk about it. I would also ask uh, that you get active in terms of testifying in the legislature. We need to hear from everyday folks, entrepreneurs, what you're hearing in your world and how that relates to, to things that are happening legislatively. So get involved, go to the state house, testify, and, uh, and we'll figure some of this out. But we need, again, we need more people in this state in order to, to satisfy the workforce, uh, to, to grow the economy. I think um, I personally feel we need more taxpayers, not more taxes. Uh, to make it more affordable. So we need to attract more. I think we're on the same page. We need more people uh, in this state, but we have to satisfy a few of those hurdles, uh, get through those uh, first, like housing, in order to do that. So thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.